Welcome to EPG Partshala. Today we are going to discuss the module Marleau-Ponty's Phenomenological Epistemology in the paper Epistemology. And this module is written by C.B. George of IIT Bombay. I am Raghuram Raju from University of Hyderabad. Let us begin by laying down a larger framework to which people, including Marleau-Ponty, are reacting to. The others, along with Marleau-Ponty, who are reacting to are Gadamer, Husserl, Heidegger, then you have uh, Charles Taylor, Habermas, in a different way. And that background is Descartes. Descartes offered something very, very radical and foundational. There are two aspects in Descartes. One, the mind-body dualism, and that comes out in what is called as the representative theory of knowledge. And there is another one, which is often taken into consideration, but not made explicit. And this is very important for students from India, because students from the West feel this problem, even though it is not stated to them clearly. And that aspect in Descartes is, Descartes introduced a very important and a novel logic of exclusion. Descartes excluded everything from proper philosophy, which is not rational. He accepted only one thing, that is cognition, and identified human beings with cognition, and ripped, peeled off, excluded everything that is non-reason. This is radical. This is radical, and, and this is also had a lasting impression and it comes to the West and modern societies in different, you know, uh, uh, in different, you know, guises. So this aspect, which is what I call as logic of exclusion, is more fundamental than the mind-body problem. Mind-body problem is one aspect of this. The larger project of modernity initiated by Descartes is to exclude everything that is non-reason. Now you understand from this background why people like Husserl, people like even before that Husserl, people like Hume, people like Kant and then Husserl and then others that I mentioned earlier like Heidegger, then uh, Habermas, Gadamer, uh, Ha uh, and uh, uh, others, including Marla Ponte, are reacting to. And in the process of reacting, they have tried to bring back those things that are excluded by Descartes. And there are two aspects, or in fact three aspects, that underline people like Marla Ponte. One is to re visit the classical philosophical themes like perception, which is a very important theme in, in, in somebody like Aristotle, though not in Plato. Plato does not you know, trust senses, but Aristotle does give importance to sense perception. That's the first one. The second one that they try to uh, you know, uh, uh, bring back is to bring back those things that are rejected by Descartes. And that's very important as consideration. The third important aspect that they try to do is to present a more realistic aspect of social and individual reality. So this is the background to make sense of many of these 20th century philosophers. And we will now see how Marleau-Ponty presents one such aspect in a very ingenious, in a very complex and systematic way. 
So let us look at Marlowe Ponte in details. Marlowe Ponte, like others, rejected the mainstream representationalism, largely attributed to Descartes, and it almost, as pointed out by you know, Charles Taylor and others, representationalism becomes equivalent to epistemology. And representationalism, as we have seen earlier, is the one where you have subject-object dichotomy and the subject-object dichotomy is continues even in different forms. The dichotomy continues even though it is not just subject and object in the form of noumena and phenomena. And then this comes to be rejected by the later empiricists, um, Locke, Berkeley and Hume. And but the problem with the traditional empiricist like Locke, Buckley, Hume on the one hand and the idealist on the other hand is that their treatment of perception is not proper. They did not look at the complex and real aspects associated with perception. The empiricist offered, empiricist like Locke offered, very mechanical and causal explanation of perception. For them, it is something that is governed by causality, that I have a perception of an object which is there, and it looks as if, you know, it's something which is causal, and it's also governed by mechanical laws. There's nothing more to it. Hume is a different kind of empiricist. He did not accept causal explanation of the subject-object uh, relation. He rejected it, but then he landed experience in the cultural and social matrix. And then he said that, that the experience or perception is a part of a customary morality and it's part of a customs and cultural associations. So experience takes place within a custom, customary morality or cultural associations. So now you have two kinds of treatment so far. One is the traditional empiricist who looked at perception or experience along the mechanical and causal route. And then you have people like Hume, who is another, who is also an empiricist, but then who rejected the causal explanation of experience or perception and then tried to look at it from the customary or cultural associations. Then you have Kant who made it possible through innate conceptions of mind. For him, perception is something that is made possible through the innate concept of mind. For somebody like Kant, the sensory intuitions are not on their own. They have no autonomy, they have no independence. They are intrinsically dependent, foundationally dependent on the innate conceptions of mind. And according to Kant, meaning is imposed on experiences by the mind. So in Kant, though he says that knowledge begins with experience but does not end with experience, thus give, seems to be giving uh, some kind of autonomy to or importance to experiences, he finally makes the experience dependent on the mind. And that is not acceptable for somebody like Marlowe Ponty. For somebody like Husserl, too, the truth of perception is derived from the transcendental perspective. And this transcendental perspective of Husserl smacks off the noumena of Kant. So they find that it is, while Husserl seems to be rejecting Kantian noumena, he seems to be expecting some forms of that in, in, through the concept of transcendental self that he brings into the discussion. And this transcendental perspective of Husserl makes this to be external to perception. So you have perception and, and this perception is dependent on a transcendental self which is external to that perception. So 
you have thus a scene where both empiricist and idealist assumed uninterpretative perception which is later interpreted that is there is something that happens i have an experience and that is not interpreted that is not an interpreted perception and then i interpret that look at the phase one phase two you know uh, trajectory that seems to be common to all of them so i have a crude perception and that perception is like a raw material unmediated un you know interpreted then then i interpret that this is unwarranted for model point there is something seriously amiss about this way of looking at perception he finds a serious objection to the very way in which perception is treated by both the empiricist and the idealist that includes all the empiricists that i mentioned to you lock book and hume and uh, the you know the idealist like kant husserl and others this is not acceptable to modern modern ponty ponty finds that perception is a very foundation of human existence so he offers what is called as phenomenology of perception where perception has an ontological status he offers ontology of perception the perception for model of ponty is not disembodied perception he doesn't accept the cartesian disembodiedness no it is not possible to have a disembodied perception embodiment is imperative embodiment is inevitable embodiment is the given thing you have no choice but to talk about the embodiedness embodiedness is not contingency embodied is not something that comes later in the in, in in the day of of the person embodiment is the constitutive aspect of human existence so he talks about embodied perception so subject is not disembodied but embodied from the beginning okay so you know there is always this embodiedness right from the beginning when i talk about embodied net right from the beginning it might give this feeling namely that i begin with myself i begin with myself because there is a embodied perception so i have a body and i have a perception and that is ontologically prior but this should not be taken as saying that i exist ontologically as an independent entity for model ponty i am already related to history i am not an autonomous person having perception even in an embodied sense i am related to history and i am not only related to history i am also related to the past and as you know that history is one aspect of the past history is an articulated aspect of the past there is lot that is there in the past which is larger than history so i am not just an autonomous individual i am an embodied person having perception in a constitutive way i am related to history and i am also related to the inarticulated past that does not that has not come in the form of history in addition to that model ponty says that i am also related to the future okay whatever i do i don't do it only taking into consideration my past and my present all my actions all my perceptions have that anticipated domain which is the treasure house of possibilities and various kinds of permanences and combinations so i am related to the future so look at the larger matrix that he is bringing onto the table for the discussion of his ontology of perception so you have a embodied person who has perception and that person is related to the history and the past and then he or she is further related to the future and all these 
things for Marlo Ponte happen in a human milieu. It is not just my time, my past, my history, my future. It happens in an intersubjective human milieu. So that milieu is important, that context, social, larger, social and the cultural context is very important in reckoning the various shades of the ontology of perception. And this is a physical situation. It's not merely a physical situation, it's also an ideological situation. I'm not there just as a, a brute a body. Yes, body is important, but I am not just that. I'm just not my you know my past and my future. I am in the world, to use Heidegger's you know famous phrase, I am in the world. I am also a person who has political views. I have ideological takes, and those ideological you know, uh, aspects of mine are derived from my social context, my moral situation. So all these things are very important for me because I am, to use this phrase again of Heidegger, I am in the being in the world and I am an embodied person who has an experience of perception. Look at the complex web of things that he is trying to bring back, reclaim, resurrect those things as I mentioned right in the beginning. This is important because these things have been excluded, shunted out, out of philosophy by Descartes. So you'll make better sense of somebody like Marlo Ponte and others that I mentioned to you earlier when you compare them and con or contrast them in relation to the kind of project initiated by Descartes, namely the logic of excluding, excluding everything which is non-reason. So let's look at the certain details about perception. We have located perception. We have located perception in a broader milieu and factored many things that provide, uh, they become like a scaffold to perception. For Marla Laponte, perception is already a precognitive thing. So it is not that, you know, I have a cognition and then, you know, I have a perception. It's very precognitive. It is pre-predicative that it is not subject and object, that I'm a subject and there is an object and I produce knowledge where there is this subject-object kind of thing. It's pre-predictive, uh, predicative. It is pre-reflective that I have perception before I reflect upon it, it is already there. If it is not there, what do I reflect? If it is not there, what do I reflect is the question that Marlopati asks. It is a pre-reflective understanding of the perceived without the support by the higher mental capacity. That is, I have perception without the help of or without being dependent on anything like transcendental categories postulated by Kant, even Husserl later. So one of the major um, uh, moves by Marlo Ponte is to disengage the dependency of perception on external things like transcendental categories, which became very fashionable with Kant and even in a modified way in the hands of Husserl. So for Marlo Ponte, perception is a brute impression. It is an embodied perception, is already interpretative without the operation of transcendental category. That's the point that I mentioned to you. So it is already interpretative, that when I have a perception, I already started interpreting. So it is not that I have a perception and then interpret, and then they are dependent on the transcendental categories. No, that doesn't happen. It's already, you know, it is independent of the transcendental categories and I start interpreting them the moment they are there. And the moment is not the moment from me. As I said, that moment is, is already, you know, it is undesignatable because the moment is related to, my moment is related to previous moments in history. My moment also is related to future moments in, 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 the, in the history. And all these things are further situated in culture and society. 
with other people into subjective thing. So all these things are very, very important to moral panty. So perception is not a bundle of meaningless sensations of this people like sense that our philosophers talked about it. They are not a bundle of meaningless sensations awaiting rational interpretation. This is the kind of a view held by empiricist. They say that we have sense data, we have perception, and then we will put them together by an external agency puts them together. They said, look, there is no external agency that binds these assorted or disconnected perceptions. The perceptions have their own internal you know, network of relations of comparing oneself with it and contrasting oneself with it. Relating oneself to it or not relating to it. This is not, there is no external agency that binds them together. They have an internal facility to make their own arrangements. So this is an important contribution of Moral Ponte. So he rejects the empiricist view who look at the perception as a bundle of meaningless sensations which are put together by mind and things like that. And with idealist, he disagrees on the following count. And he says that no sensations are invested with meaning by judgment. It's not that, you know, the sensations are in invested with meaning because of judgments. Rather, according to Moral Ponte, it is to perceive in the full sense of the world it is not to judge, but rather to grasp prior to all judgments, a sense of imminent in the sensible. So look at the move that Morloponte makes. Now he talks about not the transcendental categories that are important like Kant and Husserl. He says that there are certain imminent qualities which are within perception that make perception possible, that makes an individual to have an access to the world, outside the world. So this is a, an important move with Morla Ponte, namely that there are element qualities in the sensible and perceptible world that come to govern our perception. So for Morla Ponte, perception is not a deliberate act like willing or intentionality. Again, you see that he is taking on Husserl. He is saying that it is not intentionality. Perception is not intentionality. Intentionality is something that is pre, you know, that is not made, what that, that does not make perception thing. It is not a deliberate act like willing or intentionality. For Marla Ponte, perception is a background against which all acts stand out and is thus presupposed by them. So it is more you know, uh, 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 more fundamental than intentionality of Husserl. Without perception, you cannot have intentionality. And perception is not something which is just there. Perception is the background. He gives perception the fundamental status of being background. It is this background, perception as a background, that makes perception an ontological category. That is the place he assigns to perception, which is not done by other people. So it is in this sense, he completely rejects, you know, Husserl's act of intentionality. Okay, and he finds, for instance, one might say that, that Husserl's notion of intentionality is very, very superficial. Because what are, what are you intending? Can you intend without perception? The answer from Moral Ponte would be no. So while he rejects the act intentionality of Husserl, he offers an operative intentionality. Through this, our relation to the world is announced within us. So I have a perception of the kind that I mentioned to you. This perception has an operative intentionality. Through this person, perception, I intend certain things. And this is not an act intentionality, but an operative intentionality. And it is through this intentionality, I am put uh, myself is put in relation with the world. I announce myself to the world that I'm here. I'm here because I'm a perceiving being. I'm here because I am located in time, both into the past and to the future. And I'm also located in a social milieu. I have perception and the perception is the background. And through that background, I have 
the operative notion of intentionality with which I access the world, you know, in a, in a meaningful way. So the epistemological consequences of Morlapontes understanding of perception are enormous. If you accept perception, then of the kind that uh, Morlaponte talks about, then you have perception as a dynamic and progressive movement of transcendence from appearance towards reality. So the point that I mentioned that through intentionality, I don't just stay with what I have. What I have is very important and complex, but through intentionality and through the, this dynamic nature of perception, I can transcend myself and reach to the outer world and also reach to the higher levels of transcendence. But then that does not mean that I make transcendental categories you know, as operating on my perception. I don't make perception dependent on these transcendental categories. The perception has the inbuilt capacity to transcend itself, to go beyond the subjectivity. It can from, move from momentary appearance to optimal attitudes. It can generate its own progress. All these things are possible, not because of the external agency of categories from outside, but they are inherent, they are eminent in the very domain of perception. So you find, for instance, that perception becomes a very important category which is given an ontological status by Marleau-Ponty. So to summarize, one way of looking at people like Marleau-Ponty and others that I mentioned is not only to see that they bring some, they make the project of modernity more, you know, uh, realistic, but also to see that the, the kind of a realism that was knocked down by Descartes through his logic of exclusion, and then how that became very abstract, and that abstractness has led to serious problems of cultural crisis that Charles Taylor refers to and various other problems. So these are the people who tried to bring back what was rejected by Descartes and resurrect them in different ways so that the project, so that philosophy becomes more you know, realistic. Thank you.